It has been 40 years since a North Vietnamese tank crushed through the gates of the Independence Palace in Saigon, Vietnam, marking the official end of the Vietnam War. After more than 15 years of conflict that claimed several million Vietnamese and over 58,000 American lives, Vietnam had been reunified into a socialist republic, against the enduring wishes of the American government. Just a week prior to this event, while speaking at a graduation ceremony at Tulane University, President Gerald R. Ford remarked, Today, America can regain the sense of pride that existed before Vietnam. As I see it, the time has come to look forward to an agenda for the future, to unify, to bind up the nation's wounds, and to restore its health and its optimistic self-confidence. For a country ready to forget this tumultuous chapter in American history, this was all too easy to accept. Despite Hollywood depictions of Vietnam, memorials such as the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall, and numerous efforts directed at oral histories and memoirs, it is hard for modern America to not only define what the Vietnam War was, but to then apply this understanding to the composition of our American identity. For this reason, we fade further and further from the years of the Vietnam era without a clear understanding of what really happened to us during this focal point in American history. To fully understand the Vietnam War and its impact, one can look in one's own surroundings to find that even the biggest of cities and the smallest of towns host an abundance of memories of this pivotal stage in American history. According to the National Vietnam Veterans Foundation, about 2 million 709,918 men and women served on active duty in Vietnam during the war, with over 400,000 serving out of the state of Michigan. David Fetters of Holland, Michigan was one of these 400,000 Michigan residents who served in the Vietnam War. Dave, a Holland resident, was drafted out of Michigan State University and directed into the Army, where after excelling as a recruit, he was invited to join the Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. Separated from his wife, Trudy, and family, and sent to South Vietnam, he served for two years as an executive officer at a battle camp near the Cambodian border. This is his story. My name is Dave Fetters. I was born in Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, D.C. I was born there because my father was deployed at that time in India during World War II. My dad saw me when I was uh, six months old for the first time. We lived in and around Washington, D.C. until I was uh, seven, going on eight. Then my father took a job in Grand Haven, and then in 1956 we moved to Holland. So I'm the oldest of eight children, conservative family somewhat neutral politically, but leaning toward the conservative side. As far as religion, uh, my mother was raised Catholic, pretty much raised the children as Catholic. My father was Protestant. They demanded obedience in a loving way. All of the children had to say, yes ma'am, no ma'am to our mother, and yes sir and no sir to our father when we were asked questions and answered. We always had a formal meal in the evening could be fun, it could be serious. Uh, my mother cooked for everybody. She served everybody, as opposed to passing the plate and taking the portion that you like. She portioned everything out to make sure everybody had enough, but not too much of the good stuff. The spread of ages ended up being 19 years. My youngest sister always said growing up, she had free reign. She could pretty much do whatever she wanted. I think she, she and my younger brothers wore my family down <laughs> finally. <laughs> But my upbringing was very, very strict. But looking back, I still had a lot of fun. They took care of us. We always had uh, Christmas presents, birthday presents, uh, that kind of thing, even though my dad wasn't making a lot of money. And with the family the size we had, I, I always felt we missed out on a lot. It was crowded. It was fun, though. I graduated from Holland High School in 1962, uh, applied to University of Michigan and Michigan State University, was accepted at both. At Michigan State University, I ended up studying mechanical engineering. I finished four years of college. I had enough credits to graduate, but I didn't have a degree in anything. And at that point, this was 1966, 
So I lost my student deferment and became eligible for the draft. I was just the kind of guy that the Army wanted. Politically, I really didn't know much. It's just that if the government says, we want you to do this while you're in the Army, well, my upbringing would say, you do that. You don't turn your back on society. So that's where I am. That's where I was. I got my draft notice. I think it was the fall of 1966. It wasn't a huge shock or to my wife because I had gotten married that summer, August of 66. We both felt and talked about what was likely to happen. I'd probably end up in the Army. I figured I'd end up in Vietnam. But I loved mechanical things and decided that I wanted to be a mechanic in helicopters. I went to the recruiter and actually joined the Army voluntarily so that I could pick the school I wanted to go to, which in this case was helicopter mechanics. With that, they gave me a date to report to a reporting station in Detroit and then put you on a bus to whatever destination they chose for you to go to basic training. But I ended up at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. While I was in basic training, I was chosen to be the squad leader of the first squad. I was striving hard to learn and be the best that I could be. And that's, that's not a trite statement. I wanted to see how well I could perform. Turned out one of the guys in my squad beat me to the number one position by one point. Well, I think that caught the eye of the powers that be in the Army. So they offered to sign me up for officer's candidate school. And I declined because I still wanted to be a helicopter mechanic. So with that, they sent me to advanced individual training, which is another 10 to 12 week stint. In this case, I went to Fort Lewis, Washington, and they taught me mortars and heavy machine guns. I strived to do my best and ended up graduating first in my company. And at that point, there was no question. They wanted me to go to OCS, and they were selling it very hard. So I started OCS, and that would have been the 1st of August, 1967. I was shipped to Fort Benning, and once I started there, I was pretty much locked down. My wife was there with me. She dropped me off, and that was the last she saw me for a month until I could finally get word to her that I could go to church on Sunday morning and she could meet me there and we'd see each other for an hour and that'd be it. So OCS was six months worth of very rigorous training. They offered us the opportunity to choose a specific field within the officer corps. Well, it turned out that so many infantry officers were dying in, in Vietnam that they made the whole class infantry regardless. But that didn't stop me from trying hard. I graduated seventh out of 173 candidates. We started with a class of about 240. They took the, about the top 10 guys and offered them the opportunity to go to jump school, become airborne qualified. Then you could see if you could make it through the qualification portion for special forces. And at that point, I didn't know a whole lot about special forces, but I knew they were elite, highly trained. And I thought, if I'm gonna go to Vietnam as an infantry officer, I wanna get as much training in me and behind me as I can possibly get. So I, I made it through jump school. That was three weeks of training. And then they sent me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which is the home of Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. With that, I was assigned to a company and the officers were separated from the enlisted men. And that was three months of training. And we had a two week graduation exercise where we would uh, parachute at night into the North Carolina countryside as a team of 12 men, each member on the team would be assigned projects that, of course, tested you of being able to function under stress in conditions that weren't ideal. We had American troops in the field who were trying to catch us. We dressed in civilian clothes so that we could mingle with the population and hopefully not be identified as Special Forces soldiers, even though our heads were pretty shaven at that point. We only had one week's worth of food we were allowed to take in, so we had to scrounge food. We could buy it, but we didn't have any money. So we would offer ourselves to farmers to help them corral pigs or put chickens in crates or till the field. And then in trade, we would ask for maybe a dozen live chickens or did he have a slab of pork in the freezer? We, and we, we made do. I specifically had three jobs to do in that two-week time. One was to rob a bank. Another was to capture a gun position. And the third one was to help a downed pilot so the first one, robbing a bank, I had to do everything except rob the bank. So we did it on a Sunday morning so that we wouldn't arouse the suspicion of the local police because although they knew what was going on, they didn't know where we were or what we were doing. And the, the grader that was with our team said, I want you to do everything up to and including touching the front door of the bank. But we had, we had guards, we did recon, we set, I set up a plan, we touched the door, everybody got away without being caught. The next one, capturing the gun emplacement, they had a fake gun set up with PVC tubing, but it was guarded by a squad. 
10 guys. So I had to plan how to sneak up and capture that. So again, we did a recon, we snuck up on them, we took down the guards and captured the gun without firing a shot. And then the last one, they brought a guy into camp and he was our, quote, down pilot. So what I had to do with uh, one of the other guys on the team was to locate a source of transportation to get this guy safely from where we were, probably 150 miles back to Fort Bragg. But we ended up getting somebody that had a kind of a rusty old clunker, but, and he took us well out of the area of operation. And the down pilot said, okay, that's far enough. You know, you've safely and got me out of the, the area, got a passing grade. And then again, during that two week time, we had a night resupply mission where we had to set up a, a drop zone talk the plane in, they'd kick out a parachute bundle out of the back of the plane, hopefully it landed within the, the drop zone and not in somebody's backyard. And if anybody were hurt, we would have had to evacuate them out. I mean, physically hurt, literally hurt. And then it was a matter of going through the graduation ceremony, being awarded the Green Beret, and then being assigned to a company as an active duty officer at Fort Bragg. Initially at Fort Bragg, I was with the seventh group. I was assigned to be a, an intelligence officer, which is a staff position. I served the rest of my year at Fort Bragg. I was sitting in my S2 office doing routine paperwork and the master sergeant that was working came in with a big grin on his face and plopped this big pile of papers all stapled together in front of me and said, here you go, sir, here are your orders for Vietnam. I was less than thrilled because I was married at the time and I knew I'd have to spend a year in, in a foreign country in miserable conditions probably being shot at. I don't think my wife was resigned and disappointed as I was. And my family, uh, my dad never really talked much about it. He didn't have any significant words of encouragement, discouragement, other than just keep yourself safe. Uh, my mom didn't really express her views one way or the other. I think, like myself, they were resigned to the fact the war was going on. I was a warrior and that's where I was going to end up. I was given a 30-day leave. I went home for Christmas, New Year's, and, and I flew out uh, at the end of January in the middle of a, an extremely cold winter. This would have been 1969. We exited the plane onto the tarmac and immediately my green fatigues became soaked with sweat. It, it took a while to sink in, but I, I just realized this place smells different than where I come from. Uh, but looking around, I could see mountains, palm trees, lush vegetation. Then I spent two weeks in country, becoming uh, acclimated to the climate, doing physical fitness training. They told us that our job was to go in and try to clean up what the French started. The communists were trying to take over the country. We were helping the South Vietnamese government prevent that from happening. In the two weeks of orientation, we were mortared one evening. It didn't land very close to the barracks I was in, but it was my first taste of being in a war zone and realizing what could happen. After those two weeks, when I was assigned to my camp, I had to go through what's called the B team, which is an intermediate command and control center. From there, they assigned me to three corps, and then I boarded a Chinook helicopter. Right in the center, though, it had a about a three foot by three foot opening. So I was standing, looking down through that hole, flying over the jungle, and all of a sudden, there were green tracers coming up at us from the jungle. Green tracers are what the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong used. So that was my first indication that they don't like us very much and they're going to shoot at us when they have the opportunity. Dave's first experience under fire wasn't his last. After the journey to his camp, he would face the threat of attack from rifle, rocket, and mortar attacks on a regular basis. As a whole, Dave's camp was a defensive position with an adjoining airfield on the Cambodian border. Its primary objective was to prevent enemy North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers from trafficking weapons, ammo, and reinforcements through the area and into South Vietnam. Dave commented on his first impressions of the camp and his job as an executive officer within the camp following his deployment and insertion. My initial reaction when I saw the camp from the air was, number one, it was a five-pointed star. Nobody had told me that. The inner perimeter was reserved primarily for the American and Vietnamese Special Forces the artillery guys lived with, with us and the interpreters. The Vietnamese and Cambodians and some of the family members we had in camp were in the individual star points. Three of the companies were Vietnamese and the people that we had were AWOL from the South Vietnamese Army. They might have been jailbirds, felons. So given the choice of rotting in jail or maybe being paid by the U.S. government to do battle, they chose being uh, in camp with us. The other two companies were mercenaries from Cambodia, and these guys were fierce 
and extremely loyal to the Americans. Within the camp, there was the dynamic of the Cambodians being very friendly and close to the, to the Americans, and then the Vietnamese being kind of standoffish from the Americans. It was, it was a love-hate relationship. The main bunker we lived in was one big bunker. We had a small radio room within this big bunker. We had a small medical facility. And we also had what's called the team room, which was a place where the whole team could gather for intelligence updates, uh, maybe to watch a movie, uh, to have a cold beer. But within the bunker, we had what were called Connex containers. They were basically shipping containers. And each man on the team, all 12 of us, had an individual container. Personally, uh, I had to introduce myself to the team, which I did by calling a team meeting and giving them some background and some of my philosophy. I told them, I don't want heroes. I want you to take care of your job, take care of yourself. And uh, then I went around the room and had each guy introduce himself and tell me what his specialty was and what the problems in the camp were that maybe I could affect positively. Within the team itself, I became closest to our radio man, our chief radio op operator, Ron Ingram, and to one of the combat engineers, Wes Hulk. I found out in my first week within camp that the camp commanders felt that they weren't getting enough food for all the people they had in their companies. So they came to me as the administrative officer to try to get more food flown in, which I did. Even got live pigs, and you'd, you'd turn a pig over to a company, they'd start at the tail, work right up to the snout. Everything was used. Same thing with chicken. They would actually eat chicken feet. And of course, rice, we'd have to get a flight or two every week. I also was in charge of getting them clothing. I was in charge of the weapons. I was also the pay officer. The camp I was in had an area of operations where we didn't have any Vietnamese villages or farming or any activity. It was just basically jungle with a few clearings here and there and a river running through it. So ours was called a free fire zone. Nothing but bad guys passed through the area. We couldn't cover the whole thing on foot. We had no way of being resupplied. So we could carry with us our food and our water and our ammunition, but we could only carry enough for three or four or five days tops. And we would sweep our way back looking for intelligence, bunkers, hidden weapons, booby traps, and of course the bad guys. On occasion, our B team or the C team would set up a program whereby a, a flight of Huey helicopters uh, would be scheduled so that we could plan a Hilleborn operation. And this would take a week of planning so that we could pick out a, a landing zone, prep the landing zone with artillery fire, and it would take three complete flights to get 200 men fully loaded out in the field. And because I was the commander, I'd go out on the first flight. We'd hit the ground in a clearing, and we'd run toward the, the wood line, and you didn't know if the enemy was sitting in the wood line waiting to mow you down or not. And then what the enemy would typically do is, is have a couple guys shadow our movements. They wouldn't know where we were headed, but they'd follow us, and if we, as a unit, stopped for a 15-minute rest, rewater, you know, whatever, they'd sit back on their butts and put their rifles down and light up a cigarette, and that smell just permeates and floats through the air. The enemy can smell it. And I've smelled their cigarettes before, so I know. And they'd make noise. They'd drop a metal canteen cup. There'd be a big clank. Or they'd talk loudly. That'd be a good time to hit us. And they would initiate it because they would pick the time and the place. Typically, it was a small arms fire that would start, followed immediately by machine gun fire and rocket-propelled grenades on their side. Uh, the jungle was so thick, you couldn't see your enemy. You could tell where the bullets were coming from. They would uh, typically exceed the sound barrier when they cracked over your head, so that made a cracking sound, which I, you know, from a scientific and engineering standpoint, I thought, boy, this is, this is interesting. This, nobody ever told me that before. But then also, while you're ducking behind safety, all these twigs and leaves and pieces would come raining down because these bullets are carving up the jungle. If you've got helicopters, you've got them firing rockets, maybe machine guns, maybe mini guns, which have a blur of noise because they fire so quickly, and typically artillery from camp. If it's quiet enough, you can hear the rounds going overhead. So initially, there's panic. There's the unknown, you know, how big is the force? How long is this going to last? What do I need to tell the troops? It doesn't give you enough time to be afraid. If you have to stop and think, it's too late. I didn't feel fear, but after the fact, I was shaking. You're thinking about what, what happened, what could have happened. Did anybody get hurt? Do we need a medevac? 
the worst combat I was in, I was behind this big tree, and one of the Cambodian commanders came back to get some reinforcement because he had lost some men up on the, the front line. And just as he came around the tree to talk to me through the interpreter, a rocket-propelled grenade hit the front side of the tree that I was behind and exploded. And of course, that just rang our bells something awful. And the, you know, the stink and the noise. And at that time, I, had a, I was talking to an Air Force forward air controller who was over the area. I was talking to our camp, trying to direct artillery fire in. We had helicopter gunships on station, so I had to guide them in. Then the fighter bombers came in and dropped their load. And I was probably within 500 feet of 500 pound bombs going off. And that was exhilarating. It literally lifted you up off the ground and, and dropped you back down. And then we had some wounded and killed troops, so I had to get some medevacs in there, you know. And all this was going on at the same time. We were being fired at and bullets going overhead. And <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but at the time it was kind of serious action for a number of hours before we could finally break contact and regroup. Uh, seeing Enemy bodies uh, did not disturb me one little bit because they were typically firing at me first. In order to protect myself, I had to fire back with whatever I had at my disposal and either seeing them freshly killed from small arms fire and just uh, gathering intelligence off the bodies. I wasn't terribly disturbed. I mean, it's uh, kind of sickening. It stinks. It's just part of war that you have to put up with. On the other side of the coin, we took casualties, uh, dead and wounded, obviously. Uh, I never was, and I am very thankful for that. Uh, you know, obviously, they are human beings. I can't dwell on stuff like that because I have a job to do. And if I let that kind of stuff affect me, I would cease to function as a, a leader. If you had spent a full year in Vietnam, which was Six months of that might have been in a very active military zone. The second six months take those of us who have been out in the field for a while back to a more secure area to finish out another six months. In my case, I was invited from the A team to the C team, which is the headquarters of Special Forces Operations in all of three corps. I was given the opportunity to be the uh, daytime officer in charge of the Tactical Operations Center. The TOC, as it's called, is a glorified radio room that monitors all Allied movement in three corps as it relates to special forces. I had uh, about three communication specialists working with me every day from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was under lock and key. It was also guarded by two armed guards. The, the daily activity in the, the talk was intense, but it was supremely interesting from my perspective. You might have three or four active engagements at one time. You might have a Helleborn operation going. You might have a call for medevac. I would never identify myself. Sometimes we would have Vietnamese breaking into our radio nets, so we would talk back to them in Vietnamese and tell them to get the hell off our radio net. We also had to report our weekly activities to the commanding general, who was a three-star general. And it was my duty to get up on stage in front of this general when it was my turn and talk about Special Forces operations the previous week. Initially, I was very nervous, but I soon settled down and realized I was talking to other soldiers. I could speak their language. I did what I could as a first lieutenant in six briefings I gave them. After six months of daily routine at the Tactical Operations Center, Dave finally received his orders to return home. The morning, the very morning that I was all packed, I went to the mess hall for breakfast and there was a black sergeant, special forces sergeant, that was transferring along with me. We were to fly from Benoit Air Base to Nha Trang, which was headquarters for all of special forces in Vietnam. So I sat down with him, we were having breakfast, and lo and behold, I'd spent six months roughly at Benoit Air Base. We may have been attacked twice, but this particular morning, right smack in the middle of breakfast, the alarm goes off and we start taking mortar rounds. Well, immediately across the entryway from the mess hall was a bunker for the purpose of retreating if you came under attack. Well, we were certainly under attack, so he and I <laughs> were among the first people to enter that bunker, and we did it, I think, head first, headlong. We got in there as fast as we could. Here we were within days of leaving Vietnam, yeah, and we were under no attack. <laughs> That's right. There was no way I was going to get caught in the open and get wounded on my last couple of days in Vietnam. And we looked at each other and started laughing. We knew we were both safe. So we got on our plane and flew to Nha Trang, which is the headquarters for out-processing, a short bus ride to Cameron Bay. 
and from Cameron Bay is where a lot of troops would arrive or those rotating back to the states would leave. And there was drudgery staying in Cameron Bay. I didn't know from hour to hour when I would have a seat on a plane. As such, it took probably 36 hours sitting on my hands, not doing anything. We couldn't go anywhere because they had to be able to find us. We tried to sleep, but that didn't work very well. We were kind of excited. But eventually, the, the plane that I was to fly home on, it was a Boeing 707. Uh, we all got on. Everybody was pretty quiet until the plane left the ground. Then everybody broke into cheers and laughter and clapping. And the stewardesses were nice looking young ladies too. <laughs> Returning home, Dave flew from Cameron Bay to Japan, then on to McCord Air Force Base in Washington State. Then they divided the enlisted men from the officers, but part of the out processing was they had to draw blood. And the corpsman tried to do it casually and professionally, but when he stuck me, he missed the vein. So he had to pull the needle out and try again, but he missed the vein again. So this time, I looked at him as a stern officer would, but I said, man, if you stick me again and miss, you're gonna be in deep trouble. He stood there for a minute, kind of ashen-faced, and he just waved me on. He never did take a blood sample. He didn't want to try again and miss. There were four other guys, so the five of us found a taxi and had him run us from the Air Force Base to SeaTac, which is the Seattle-Tacoma Airport. And we got there and got on a plane, flew all night. My wife was given some wrong information, so she was not in the terminal when I arrived home, but uh, made it home about 9 or 9.30 in the morning, and she picked me up. We stopped to see my dad at work and my family, and uh, I went home. I'd been up 48 hours straight. I was just pumped, but physically worn out, so my wife told me I slept probably 12 hours straight without moving. Finally got up, wobbled around, got a drink of water, went to the bathroom, went right back to bed. And she said the whole time the dog was sleeping right with me. Both my wife and I dove back into college life. We found it to be uh, interesting, but fully involved all of our time. The engineering curriculum was mostly at the engineering buildings, which was out of the center of campus. And that was a good thing because campus life at that time was interrupted almost daily with anti-war protesters. There were just thousands of students protesting in the streets. Now here I am, 25 or 26 years old. I had serious goals, I had serious responsibilities, I had serious classwork. I avoided anything to do with the, the war protest. I didn't pay attention to it because I had enough on my plate. I didn't dress in any of my army uniforms because that would be inviting uh, anti-war protesters down to me on a personal basis if anybody spotted me with combat boots on or fatigue pants. So I finished up my undergraduate engineering degree in a year and a half. It took me another full year, four full terms, to get my master's degree in mechanical engineering with a minor in business. Started sending out resumes, realized that I really kind of wanted to get back to Holland because I, I love living there. It's a great little town. It's where most of my family was at the time. After receiving his master's, Dave worked as a mechanical engineer until 2007 for various companies, most notably the Hart & Cooley firm located here in Holland. He commented on his return to Holland and his participation in the Holland Memorial Day parades, saying, I wasn't particularly aware prior to going into the service that Holland was very patriotic or not. I just wasn't aware of it if they were. But after I got back, I was certainly aware of the Memorial Day Parade in which they asked for veterans to walk in the parade and be recognized. <clears throat> so I started doing that and have pretty much done that every single year for the last 30 years or so. And the people that turn out are, are very grateful. Um, they applaud us. They hold up signs. They, they're great. Yeah. Do you appreciate that, that feeling? Yeah, do I do. Do you feel appreciated by the community? I do. So I continue to do that. <clears throat> I don't get real emotional about it, except when I talk about it. When I'm, when I'm in the parade, it's just fun, yeah. as long as the weather's halfway decent. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And my family's always there, so I get to see them. In the fall of 2000, the transcribing of his audio tape sent between himself and his wife during the war initiated a process to return to Vietnam where Dave was able to tour several important sites, such as the remains of his old camp, now a farm field, 
Nui Baden Mountain, a strategically important mountain in his area of operations, as well as visits to the cities where he completed his tour of duty. He said it gave him a sense of satisfaction to have brought his wife that far into his Vietnam experience, as well as having the ability to recount it for himself. He still maintains updated on his area of operations. A recent internet search brought him satellite photos of his camp, still standing eerily in the shape of a star. When reminiscing about the war itself, Dave acknowledged how the war was being fought and how it changed the dynamic of America. Uh, when I was there, I even, I even realized that it, the way the war was being conducted, it was probably a, a waste of effort, manpower, money, time. We got no recognition, no welcome. However, since that time, there's been a dramatic change, I think, and more and more, especially Vietnam vets, uh, are being recognized and praised and thanked for their service. After the fact, a lot of people recognized how poorly led we were for that conflict. So I think more and more people have come to realize that we would have to demand more from our military service personnel, we have to demand more from our politicians, we have to be more aware of what they're getting us into, rather than just running off and saying, well, we're going to fight a war. And Fifteen billion dollars later and 58,000 lives lost later, we say, gee, that, that wasn't such a good thing, was it? Now retired, Dave spends his time with his wife and family, fishing with friends, and serving as the president of the Michigan chapter of Special Forces Veterans. Dave's experiences in Vietnam left a mostly positive impression on his life, that it helped him better understand himself and his abilities. I enjoyed most of it. I certainly enjoyed the opportunity to learn new things in the Army. I didn't like the Vietnam experience per se. I can look back and say it, was, it, it had a positive influence on my life. My experiences in Vietnam have always lived with me. I've always retained those memories. When I, basically, when I came home, I kind of put it behind me. I had so much stuff in front of me, I couldn't dwell on it, didn't want to dwell on it. And over time, I think you tend to soften the stuff that was harsh and remember more of the fun stuff. Turning in the grain again the bells began to chime Time, she says, there's no turning back Keep your eyes on the tracks Through the fields, somewhere there's blue Oh, time will tell, she'll see us through time.